people think I'm damaged goods. I'm worried about losing my job. Will I ever get a transplant? I want to see my children graduate from college. How can I afford this? I don't want to be a burden. I'm afraid. I'm overwhelmed with information. Sometimes I wonder if I'll ever fall in love and get married. I just want to play with my friends. You're listening to Kidney Talk, streaming health, happiness, and hope to the renal community with your hosts, Lori Hartwell and Stephen First. And welcome to Kidney Talk. This is our last interview in Palm Springs, and we saved the best for last, didn't we, Lori? Definitely. Mike Paget is a, a wonderful person. I can't wait to learn more about him. Now, how do you know that's the way he pronounces his name? It Mike looks Paget. French. Well, it looks we like can Paget. ask him. Could be Paget, but I think it's Mike Paget. He's from England, and have you ever been to London? I have been to London, and I've been to many cities in the UK. I was in London, and I'll never forget, I went to Trafalgar Square. Yes. And I had all these pigeons land on me. I love that. It I, was, I have it a was, picture. My son uh, Griff is covered in pigeons when he was like six years old. I know, but old. that's like a bunch of rats hanging out on you after you learn about how dirty the pigeons that's are. That's the London dungeon where the, the rats oh, come out. It was, I, I have a picture of Griff dude, covered really? with pigeons. It's, yeah. yeah, I don't know what that's all about, why they all flocked at Trafalgar Square. Well, today we're here to talk to Mike Paget, and he's going to tell us what it was like. He came over here about 20, over 25 years ago and he has some really unique experiences that he can share with us about what dialysis was like in England. Oh, and he, oh, he was at the beginning stages of dialysis in England? Then, yeah, he's got some interesting stories. So I, I hear it's the same except they use a different accent. We'll have to find out. Oh, I just love pretzels. Let's, let me see here. One serving is six pretzels? What, are they kidding me? Who only ate six pretzels? I have to stay on my renal diet. I know. I can bite part of one pretzel, then bite the side of another pretzel, and then I hook them together, and I can count that as one pretzel. Mm. Boy, that was good. You know what I love now? A big gulp. Now if I fill it up halfway, and then drink it, and refill it to the top, Now, that won't count towards my daily fluid intake. Or will it? Make the connection. Eating high-sodium foods makes you thirsty, which will make you retain more fluids. Do you want to share a tip on how to stay within your fluid limit? Email us at kidneytalk at rsnhope.org, and we'll let our listeners in on your different tips. First mate, he got drunk. Broke in the cap. And welcome, Mike Paget, or is it Paget, like I said? Are it's, you French? It's not French. It's Paget. 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 Yes. Ah. And See, what, I told you I was right. Right. And, and what nationality is that? It's British. It's British. Well, as oh, we like okay. to say, English. So, yes. you know, it's like, you think British people are constantly condescending and everything, kind of like Simon Cowell because of him, you know? And, and how do you overcome that obstacle in your life? <laughs> I just tell everybody I have a speech impediment, and they right. get over it then. And <laughs> that I'm the one that's speaking the Queen's English. The Queen's, Queen's English. I, so I'm not sure what you guys are speaking. I love the British accent. I think it sounds so eloquent, and I love it when they tell you what's on the menu. It makes all the food sound better. You mean fish and chips? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what brought you here from England? Oh, I'm glad you asked that, Laurie. It was obviously a Boeing 747. <laughs> No, but actually it was a young lady, but we won't go there. That's what br- brought you to America? Well, the need to be with this young lady. This but, young lady. Yeah, and so are you still with this young lady? Unfortunately, no. It only lasted two weeks. But yes. so, right. so what and city? When, to uh, actually North Hollywood. North Hollywood. Yes, was sorry. she an actress? No, she wasn't an actress. And, and what no, happened it? after two weeks? It, it didn't work out. Should we just... <laughs> I mean, did she, did she not like you? Or? Well, I understand you were involved in dialysis in the United Kingdom. How long ago was that, and what was it like back then? That was back in 1968 in the... 1968? That's that when be- I started dialysis. Yes. Yeah. Was that before um, American dialysis? 
When did American Dialysis well, see It started Seattle in start? the uh, early 60s. It no, was, that's, not, that's very noncommittal. I know it's 1962 because I have the Life magazine article about the committee who chose who was going to live and who was going to die. Committee, yeah. And it was November 1962. Well, some of the equipment that we use was American that were put into some of the dialysis machines that I work with back in the early 60s or late They were 60s. big, weren't they? Mike? Extremely big. Yes. Right, and, and how long did people have to stay on the machine? What's coming back again? Nocturnal dialysis. These patients dialyzed on their own in their homes during the night for about eight to ten hours. But and the machine was enormous, wasn't it? Like the size it? of a washing machine, at oh, least, tw right? Twice the size of a washing machine. Like a double stacked washing machine. Oh, a double stacked wow. washing machine. I mean, you couldn't. Certainly, Laurie couldn't see over the top. Of, I couldn't even see over the top of the machines. They were that tall. Oh, my Laurie yeah. can't see over the top of a step stool. <laughs> uh, how did you get involved? What were you doing with dialysis patients back in 68? Yeah, I was involved in the, uh, the service and maintenance of all the dialysis machines for this company uh, in the United Kingdom. And so you all, fixed them? I used to fix them and do the routine maintenance for in these patients' homes. And how did you, how did you get into that? How did you I, learn... I this new machine, did, were you working for an engineer company? I was an engineer, I had studied electronics, my degree and background is in electronics. And uh, I got into, offered this job. With a minor in dance? Minor in dance, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was just interested in this medical field and knew nothing about dialysis. And uh, it was a new word to me. Uh, it was new at the time, I mean this was in the very embryonic stages. And we got started, and they showed us these machines, and they showed us how to repair them, how to maintain them, and where do we go now? Well, they're going to a patient's home. To a home. Home, oh, wow. And everything in the UK, with one exception, there was only one freestanding clinic in the whole country at that time. So everybody had to do home dialysis if they do, wanted yeah. dialysis. Yeah. Wow. Um, and and who, in, who actually invented the dialysis machine, the very first one? Kolf. Do Dr. Dr. Kolf. Kolf. Wilhelm Kolf from William Holland. William Kolf, yeah. um, I think create the first dialysis machine. So tell us what it was typically like during that time for a patient uh, well, to be on dialysis. They will be selected to be on dialysis. They With a committee? Somewhat a committee. It wasn't quite the same way as here, the Life and Death Committee. It's the socialized medicine, and it very starts with your primary physician, or your GP as they call them there, your general practitioner. Mm -hmm. He would really decide, or she would decide, that you are a candidate for dialysis and then refer you to one of the few hospitals that had that program. And if you were lucky enough for the nephrologist referral to work out for you, and you had all the right requirements that would mean a home, where you could have at least one bedroom converted into a, a small little mini clinic. This, if you remember, is in the days with those large keel dialyzers, which yeah. were one keel. meter keel, unfortunately. Dr. Keel, yeah. why couldn't he come up with a different name yeah. than keel as his last name? Wasn't the, yeah. And these were you know, a yard long, one meter long and they had to be reused. So you had to have a big, massive stainless steel sink in your bedroom to, mm -hmm. to do that process, then this big wardrobe type machine and your bed. And that was- There just wasn't any room. Was and there? you had very often, the homes had to have a new flooring put in to support all this additional weight. And that was a major problem. So that was one obstacle, obstacle to getting people on home dialysis. dialysis. And we, was everybody doing it at night, Michael? Yes, everybody did it at night. Because the other obstacle, what you, you want to have some value to society, meaning they want you to be working. Mm -hmm. So obviously you needed to work five days a week and then three nights a week you would dialyze. And it was typically like here, Monday, Wednesday, Friday was the premium nights that these home patients would dialyze. So how yeah. did it work if you didn't have the, a big enough house to be able to, you know, set up the house with all this equipment? Well, as they got more and more patients into the system, they started to run against that obstacle. And they came up with a unique idea of having these porter cabins, like little single wide trailers, if you will, that will be placed in the, the patient's uh, garden, plumbed in, and it was a ready-made clinic, ready to go. Oh, and wow. There was one unique story that, unfortunately, this all got selected, and when they got ready to make the delivery, they realized they couldn't get this trailer around the side of the house. So they actually contacted the Royal Air Force, and they came in with a helicopter, and they picked up this trailer, and they lifted it over the house and just dropped it in the backyard. So they dropped the clinic right in the backyard, Instant, huh? yeah. And, and the joy is when the patient gets, you know, hopefully transplanted, they could then go back in and just pick it up and take it to the next one. So they kind of started to like that concept. And right. how popular were transplants back then? Um, they were in their embryonic stages too. I mean, that was always the goal, is to get the patient at home, get them stabilized, and get them transplanted. But I think it's the same need as we have now, is to, you know, the availability of, you know, of kidneys. Mm -hmm. Can you what, imagine?
imagine looking out your door and you're seeing this helicopter fly <laughs> over with a little trailer and dropping it in somebody's backyard? Then you go ask them, oh, this is their little clinic in their health care clinic in the backyard. It, I bet you it brought a lot of awareness to the community of uh, what kidney disease was about. It did. It got a lot of media coverage and you know, TV coverage as well. And yeah, yeah. didn't it help with like target practice too? They wanted to, it was, well, the Air Force liked it or the Royal, what is it called? Royal Air Force. Royal Air yeah, Force. RAF, yeah. They liked it because they're not allowed to fly over residential areas and do these sort of things. So this was good practice for them to get into a residential area and fly low and and, and do this work. So and it was, a, it it was a win-win situation. And really say, sa- yeah. and they're saving people too. Yeah. And how successful was these newer dial these earlier dialysis machines? Were they what was the uh, you know, mortality rate for people on I, dialysis? I don't then? know the numbers because I'm not a clinician. But knowing that the program, unlike here where you're trying to sell different machines, the only company that we sold machines to was the, the government. They were a customer, and they would buy our machines and place them into the various hospitals. And we just saw this constantly. You know. How can we make more and more machines? The man was there, and it just, you know, we saw, you know, the good side. A lot of these patients did get transplants, and it was always good for us to go out, and you know, one of our engineers had to pick up a machine and bring it back and reservice it all and put it out to another patient because there was a successful transplant. So that was always the good side. Since you were at the beginning of this dialysis phase, Working with this, how quickly after it first started to happen in 1968, did you see the machine start to get smaller and more efficient? When I go to Purdue, I never did until I come to the United States. Oh, so yeah. you were there till when? Six, 77. So from 68 to 77, they all stayed the same. There was never much. any they, they got a little shorter. We came out with a shorter version, uh, which Laurie oh. could look over the top of. I was just going <laughs> to yeah, say, that's yeah, the one for Laurie, yeah. yeah. The petite version. But, yes. <laughs> the electronics wasn't there then as well. That The you know, microcircuitry, we were using you know, big relays and big components. Uh, it's not until, as we know now with our own electronics, how it's all been micronized. And you came out to L.A. in 77? 77. You immediately go into the dialysis field here in Los Angeles? Yeah, Los Angeles. Yes, I did. I, I started working for a company called Drake Willock. And again, servicing the, you know, the dialysis mm-hmm. equipment, uh, in, basically in Southern California. And what did you think when you saw the smaller dialysis machines? It was kind of a neat little machine. It was still fairly mechanical. Uh, it wasn't like the high-tech machines we have. Now, we're talking 30 years ago. We've right. come a long way. But it was still based in mechanical, uh, needed a lot of maintenance, which was why myself and other people were here taking care of that. But one thing I couldn't help noticing is that, and I again, I'm not a clinician, but I noticed the patients, they look sicker. And I, Here in the, in, the in, States? in the States? In the States. Uh, and I couldn't put my hand why is this they look more uremic and you know they just sat in the chairs because all we were doing then was dealing with machines in these clinics i would go into a clinic and there was 20 of my machines lined up and they say hey mike these two over there need servicing or this one has a problem and i look around and see these patients i thought why aren't they uh, what did you attribute this to well Vic just started to find out that here we were doing dialysis a lot shorter right you no know, mm-hmm. they were doing four hour five hour dialysis treatments how uh, long was it in the UK? It was still eight to ten hours. Eight to ten hour treatments. Yeah. And when dialysis first started here in America, it started in Seattle, and the dialysis was eleven hours per yeah. session in mm-hmm. when it first started in the early sixties. So when we come back, we're going to find out yeah, more, more about his experiences here in the United States. And you have some recipes from England that you're going to uh, share with us. And his he's very famous for his spotted dick. Well, now that I have mastered Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers, how many pickled peppers did Peter Piper pick? Let's see what my next challenge will be. It's in here somewhere. Hmm. Say this three times fast. Fistula first feels fantastic for future fitness. Fistula first feels fantastic for future fitness. Fistula first feels fantastic for future fitness. Now if I only knew what that means. A fistula should be your first choice for your dialysis access. It says here, less infection and less hospitalizations. That's good. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> Lasts longer. Some patients have had their fistula for more than 30 years. Oy. Sounds like a no-brainer to me. Fistula first feels fantastic for future fitness. For more information, please visit fistulafirst.org. Do it now. Come for the 
And we're back with Mike Patchen, the Brit from England. Where else would he be if he's a Brit, right? So please explain the spotted dick. <laughs> Just for Stephen. Well, yeah. Oh, it's delicious. It's but he delicious. knows it's delicious. It's I eat a, spotted dick all the time. It's like a sponge suet pudding with raisins and sultanas, and normally served with hot, creamy custard over. And you know what always fascinated me was uh, Yorkshire pudding, which you think is a dessert. Yorkshire right. pudding, but it's really meat drippings on a bun or something like that. Oh, right? really? I didn't know that. Just batter, right. basic batter, yeah. Yeah, it's, just, it's just a, a piece gravy. of bread so and you really just pour meat drippings you. on yeah. it. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about when you came over here, patients were dialyzing a lot less time. So you immediately saw that they weren't doing as well. What else did you observe? That, that, that was sort of the first thing. I, I kind of saw this, why weren't these patients at home? You know, I realized, you know, having spent you know, nine years in England dealing with nothing but home patients and seeing all leading healthy, normal lives, going to work every day, having families, living in their home. And here, all these patients were charged to come to these clinics you know, three, times three days a week. A week. Like a yeah. part-time job. Yeah. And, and did you bring this up to, like, your superiors or to the clinic, people who own the clinics? And Well, I, you know, I wasn't... Or you just in, shut up? I just shut up. Ah. Yeah. Who wants to listen Smart to a Brit? Did yeah. you wonder why we were driving on the wrong side of the road? That did cross my mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of put all this together and think, well, yeah. They're the colonies have gone to, you know, in a handbasket here. Right. <laughs> Back in England, the patients were doing more home dialysis. Did they focus more on like the psychosocial issue? Is that why it was so important for them to be home? They, or yeah, they really believe they got to get the patient back into the normal environment, right? And not treat them. And I, a day here, I still can't think why we refer to them as patients. If we can get them back into their normal environment, and yes, they have this need to be have their kidneys used artificially three times a week, mm-hmm. why are they still patients? They look normal, healthy, live a, lo- a healthy life, go to work every day, except for the weekends, hopefully. Why do we still refer to them as patients? Mm-hmm. But here I People see People with it. an illness. <laughs> yeah. I see it here, they come into a clinic. So you, you get that, I'm sick, I'm coming to a clinic three times, I have to be dialyzed. Right. And I, psychologically, I think that's got a... Yeah, because a lot of people are at the end of their life when they're on dialysis, unfortunately. And, you know, I was on home dialysis for nine years, but in center for three. And I think being at home didn't expose me to some of the, the sadness that just happens with the end of life issues. And in England, though, did they basically select the best of the best to be on dialysis? There had to be some of that in that early mm-hmm. stage, unlike quite the life and death committees. But they were, and that was one of the justifications given to me by some of the clinicians, that, well, you, you've got a selection process. You're only getting the best ones on there. And there certainly probably was an element of truth in that. But as you know, we're talking of 30 plus years ago, as that's transitioned now, that I'm sure that has changed. But back and then, they were not going to put somebody in their mid-70s on dialysis. Correct, they were not. But they, they did somebody but younger. They did have pediatrics. Right, uh, but we're uh, here in the United States. We would not do uh, pediatrics when when the committee was here. Right. That that was not allowed. Or on the side, even diabetics weren't. Yeah, right. I don't think uh, they type one. they didn't yeah accept diabetics, and I think they they did accept a thirteen year old uh, the death committee, uh, Bonnie. Bonnie, yeah. Bonnie Markinson, who's still alive today. And where does she live? She lives in Seattle. Oh my gosh! She still so she was on dialysis. You know, I got the original. It, it was just fascinating. I, I did get the original article that was in Life magazine, and it was a fascinating article. And it was there was a lot of press on this committee. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. how do you decide who's going to live and who's going to die? And it's just a, what I thought was interesting too is the committee was made up of not doctors or professionals, but a priest, a, a union worker, teacher, yeah. a housewife. housewife. Yeah. 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 So I, I find that really, really fascinating. In the United States, we've kind of gone full circle because now we're at a meeting and the big push is home dialysis, yeah. self care, nocturnal. nocturnal. Yeah. It's like we're going full circle. Do you think we're going back to the future? I definitely think it took us 30 years, but what I think that's where we're heading. a movie, huh? Yeah, they should back use that. Back to the future. <laughs> I like that. You know, what do you think of the new fangled home dialysis machines? Oh, I think they're fantastic, especially the fact that some of them, I understand, are even somewhat portable. I mean, they're not wearable, but you know, if you want to go on vacation, you can take them with you. 
Right. And I They're know we have patients that are traveling that do just that. And the thing is, it's it's more, like you said, the people look better because it's more frequent. Uh, most people on the home dialysis machine uh, do it six days a week, you know, for a little bit yeah. shorter period of time, but they're getting, the more dialysis you get, the better. Yep. Right. And I understand here that our challenge is, though, is reimbursement, mm-hmm. that we're only paid for three, you know, times, a week three times a week, maybe one extra treatment yeah. a month. So, so how do they barriers. get around that, Lori? Well, I think a lot of times what I'm hearing is for the more frequent dialysis that they're working with the fiscal intermediaries, fiscal intermediaries to make it an exception and to pay for the extra treatment or the clinics are just eating it. And well, the thing uh, is, it costs them less to do it because there, there's no tax to pay, there's no right. rent to pay, there's no... The real yeah. critical thing, though, what I've heard for home dialysis is actually the training. There's clinics three don't, weeks of training. Clinics do not get reimbursed okay. for the training, so it's very hard for clinics to even start a training program because if you only have one or two patients... How do you justify creating a whole training program when you're not going to get paid for it? And you, so you have to really put together a, a whole plan to make it happen or you lose money. You know, it's funny in the medical field, Mike, that uh, we forget that it is a business and we all it think a- it's for the mercy of life and everything. But it really is. People still have to make money, mm-hmm. you but, know. But and, in the UK, remember, this socialized medicine. So we, I, I came here and didn't have this concept of, worrying about you know making an appointment to go and see my doctor and then getting a, a bill for a hundred dollars in the uk you just go to see your doctor and you yeah. don't get a bill there's no bill why why would there be a bill if it's socialized medicine yeah. well it's well, just fast i mean i get all these you know bills and you know it's just would be i can't even oh, comprehend that so, i can't so comprehend so that my, it's almost a full-time job to keep tracking your medical bills with right. what insurance yeah. pays i know that my wife has to sit down a good 10 minutes a day um mike what is your opinion of the difference between now that you've lived in both countries for a lengthy but, period of time well certainly socialized medicine has a lot to be said for it it is healthcare for everybody you know it, it's like any system it's only as good as the money that goes into it and the money that goes into it is the tax dollars that come from the, you know, the aren't British your folks. taxes a lot higher the taxes anymore? are a lot higher to pay for that system right so it's it's a balance so you eventually pay for it anyway you're paying for it yes right, right. yeah it, it's but it's it's spread out over everybody that's right the so that's the, because normal i think normal here a family is almost ten thousand dollars a year for mm-hmm. uh health insurance yeah about, i'm paying a thousand dollars a month yeah yeah between it's expensive. And, yeah, yeah, it is expensive. And some people can't even get health insurance. That's the real... Right, that's uh, the big You thing. know, that's the sad thing. Do you know I applied to be a dual citizen in Canada? And this was years ago, way before kidney disease. And they turned me down because um, I was a diabetic. And they didn't yeah, want me draining their medical system, their system because yeah. diabetics have a history of being sick. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's very interesting. And But I also hear that, like, let's say you're sick on a socialized medicine like Canada or England and you have to wait for a doctor for like two weeks three weeks to get an appointment is that true or is that uh, false that's not true I mean I still have family back there that I, and I visit every year and there, there's certainly circumstances as there would be here I mean I've had the same need here to wait three weeks to see a, a specialist so yes you can always come up with those you know, quote horror stories of that but if you're in need uh, you have an accident, you have a heart attack or whatever it may be, you go to that emergency room, they're not asking you for your Blue Cross Blue Shield card before they see you, you go straight in. The, the problem here that, that makes our system not work is that people who don't have insurance, morally, the emergency rooms can't turn them away. When people have a cold, though, they go to the emergency room. Yeah. And they drain the system anyway, and that's why we're seeing an epidemic of emergency rooms across the country well, closing. We're, we're paying for them to have health care in a very expensive manner. A very yeah. expensive yeah. manner, and these are people actually that are not even part of the country anyway. Well, it's unfortunate because a couple of weeks ago um, we were having a speaker training and one of our PEP speakers got sick and started throwing up and she has a transplant and we were really worried that she'd get dehydrated and you know, she had to go to emergency. <laughs> But the comments was like, the people here aren't sick. I mean, it was like it was 10 o'clock at night. Oh, let's go to the emergency room. And, you know, they can't turn them down. But wasn't that an interesting issue there, Laurie? 
the paramedic ambulance was there, the fire truck was there at the hotel, mm -hmm. and they were there for at least 30 plus minutes before mm -hmm. they could find an emergency room moved. that would accept the patient. Right. Oh. In Los Angeles. Yeah, and we were was, all worried about because yeah. she was in the um, uh, paramedic truck, and you know we were like, is she, I'm like, she's better off sitting in the paramedic truck than than um, being in the emergency room, sitting in the lobby yeah. or whatever. You know, you have all these paramedics around her, and she's going to be actually get better attention. And, and you know, in I, the paramedic is it truck. true, Michael, that the physicians and the healthcare workers don't get paid the astronomical fees that some of the, I won't say all, but some of the doctors do here in the, in That's the States? That they're employees of the federal government. And, and they, they make just a normal living. A normal salary, yes. Right. Yeah. Because I, I got to say, I went to UCLA, uh, that's University of California, mm -hmm. Los Angeles, and uh, they said I was having a heart attack, which I wasn't. It was a false alarm. Um, I sometimes like to practice my acting skills and pretend like I'm having heart attacks. <laughs> and they called an ambulance and they... I swear, Michael, they drove me from one uh, across the street from Westwood Boulevard to the other side of Westwood Boulevard, and the bill was eight hundred dollars <laughs> to take me from one side of the campus to across the street to the other side of the campus, and that's what causes our insurance rates to go up, and you know. And then, how uh, much was it to process that bill? <laughs> yeah. And in the UK, that would been free. Absolutely. I've, I must admit, as a child, I've had a little accident here and there and broken arms, and my mother would never worry about dialing the emergency number because the ambulance would come and pick me up and take me to the casualty, not the ER. It's called, it's the, called casualty. the casualty. It's like a war yes. term, huh? Yeah. <laughs> takes you to the casualty, and there was no issue of worrying about money. How much is it going to cost to fix my poor son? Or am I going to lose my house or whatever because I have a sickness? And that has been true. If you would come to visit the UK and... Uh, Something would unfortunately happen to you, you would be taken care of as a visitor. And they won't and charge they you? They won't charge you. Really? Oh, Even wow. as a visitor? Yeah. Because wow. I know that, I recently Now, there are some private hospitals that would if you went to a private hospital, but they, for the most part, because they're not set up to bill you. They They'll don't bill have, you. There's no administrative function as, uh, you know. So, so they funny. save a lot of money right there, don't they? That's it. That functions Well, we took a cruise la about a year and a half ago, and the new form of making money on cruises is health care. Because my mom got nauseous and, you know, she had to go to the infirmary. And, I mean, it was like $150 for this shot and 300 for this shot and just all these and different things. And these are things. like offshore uh, doctors, uh, and, too. But they're making the... money off of it. Well, I mean, yeah, it's absolutely. not, you know, I think they're like a private practice that's allowed to have a shingle in the ship. Exactly. And they as many rent. things as they... They pay, they pay rent. Yes, yeah. and then whatever they can get you to buy in the... Uh, like you need this and you're like well you're on vacation you don't want to be sick the whole time so okay it's worth the extra three hundred dollars for the nausea shot or whatever it is and i'm like wow this is a real scam and these here the same cruises that you go on and then get sick on the whole ship comes down with right something. exactly <laughs> but you get a good a discount good, yeah. you get a good discount. discount everybody has e coli <laughs> so uh, you know i work a lot in eastern europe and I, I had an accident there um, where I cut my leg real bad. And it's funny, the system there is different because it's not socialized or free since they're not communist anymore, but you could trade things for medical care. Like I gave the guy a sheep. <laughs> no, I, but I, I swear, I, I cut my leg and I go there and it was, they did not, I, I said, I'm a diabetic, so you need to probably put me on antibiotics right away. Because you, especially in the lower extremities, he goes, "Why would I put you on antibiotics?" Except he had a thick Bulgarian accent, and um, he says, "We don't use antibiotics here unless you get infected." You know, which <laughs> I thought was a really interesting concept. Whereas here in America, we do all this preventative <laughs> medicine, and we probably overprescribe. And first of all, I was so scared because I walk in, and it it looked like I walked into a medical office from the 1940s. You know, it just everything was like you know 50 years behind but i you know i i healed perfectly he was wonderful and they made house calls they came to the oh, yes. studio and saw me and when he saw my leg he says i need to have to take you back to the office but they, he came in this little tiny car with a big like red cross on the side it was very <laughs> very funny very yes. funny yeah. yeah well in england to this day the gps as i call them general practitioners would still make house calls oh really yes. really if you can't go to the, the they call it a surgery which is the off doctor's office. If you can't make it there, they will come out and they see you. They call it. the doctor's office a surgery. surgery. Yes. And then the when it you have a broken confused. bone, it's casualty. Ca you go to the casualty. What other? Yeah. Any other terms? Uh, it, 
What's the operate? Oh, the operating room is the what's it's there's a new there's a name for the operating room. It's theater. the theater oh, room. Theater. Yes. Yeah, theater. the operating room's a theater don't room. No shows though. No, no shows. <laughs> this is really interesting having you here and hearing about the first dialysis happening in England and then you coming over here and chasing that little girl. And, <laughs> and then, um, uh, you know, if you give me her name and social security number, I will find her for you. Let me go home. Why don't they let John me go home? home. To me, that is amazing, you know, that he was on the beginning stages and he saw those machines and everything. It's almost like a museum piece. I bet you there is one in a museum yes. somewhere. There, well, there is dialysis museums. I know that have traveled to some of the different trade shows. Isn't there one in the Hollywood Wax Museum? I don't think so. But we should really lobby for that. Well, to have one in yeah, the Hollywood Wax Museum? Yeah, to have a, yeah. It'd be so cool to have like James Dean on a dialysis machine, <laughs> all wax. <laughs> Well, I think that it's fascinating how uh, the concept of having a little trailer drop into somebody's backyard. It's kind of like those things today. Have you seen these in people's yards? They're called pods. Pods. And they what drop they them off in people's yards, and you can you you load them up with the storage, mm -hmm. and then they pick it up. And they take it to a storage center. I didn't center. know that. Yes, That's it's a great idea. See, they need to do the same thing with home dialysis because when I was on peritoneal dialysis, I actually had to have a shed bill to put all my supplies in because it, there was so many supplies that I didn't have any place for them in my apartment. Did, you, did your parents ever threaten to take you out to the woodshed? We can control our own destiny. We can take charge of our health and ask questions about our medical options. We can form partnerships with our healthcare team. We can take steps towards self-improvement. We can be sensitive to the impact of our disease on our family. We can sing, dance, laugh, and enjoy our lives. We can appreciate today and look forward to tomorrow. We can help and support our fellow patients. We can pursue our hopes and dreams. We can make a difference. Renal Support Network would like to thank everyone who has made this show possible. Kidney Talk's founding sponsor is Amgen. Generous support is provided by Roche Pharmaceuticals and Astellas. Friends of Kidney Talk are Abbott Laboratories, American Region, and Fresenius Medical Care North America. Thank you for helping us stream health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. Visit rsnhope.org for more information. The opinions, recommendations, statements, and advice contained on Kidney Talk are for information only. You should not use the information on the show to diagnose or treat a health problem or disease without first consulting with a qualified health care provider. Please consult with your health care provider about any questions or concerns you may have regarding your condition or dietary regimen.